Hamilton's Principle. For all you aspiring structural dynamicists out there, this is the holy grail. If you can't get excited today about learning Hamilton's Principle and learning to derive it from scratch, the field of structural dynamics might not be for you. Hamilton's Principle is truly one of the most powerful, elegant, and simple equations I've ever encountered. In order to better understand what it was that Hamilton was trying to achieve, this is a chart that I showed in a previous video on variational calculus. And I think the important things to note here are, first of all, 1834, Hamilton's principle, but everything that came before that. We had Newton's second law. The Brachistochrone problem then suggested that there were some shortcomings with Newton's law where sometimes it would be beneficial to be able to derive equations of motion in what I would call useful coordinates. And with this, the idea of generalized coordinates was born. Lagrange, of course, studied this a lot. Euler formalized this in terms of the calculus of variations. The idea of Hamilton's principle is he wanted to incorporate everything that had happened up to that point in structural mechanics, and he wanted to incorporate it in a single principle. So the starting point was Newton's second law, F equals MA. And, you know, the interesting thing about F equals MA is, have you ever seen that proven? Can you prove that F equals MA? And I'm not talking about through empirical evidence where you go into a lab and you do some testing. I understand you can demonstrate it that way, but why is F equal to MA? I mean, why is that? Can that be shown mathematically that there's no other way? The answer is yes. It can be shown using Hamilton's principle that F equals MA. Take the Lagrange equations, which we've seen examples of in several other videos. Incredibly powerful technique. We haven't yet derived it. Again, this can be easily derived from Hamilton's principle. I want to just add a couple of things to this timeline. The one was when Lagrange published his Lagrange equations. That was in 1764. Lagrange developed his approach in 1764 in a study of the libration of the moon. That's the sort of twinkling and flickering effect on the moon. So he was actually using it to study optics. Hamilton, after all, was an astronomer, and he was a professor of astronomy at Trinity College in Dublin. The problem with Newton's second law, as many of you have experienced firsthand, is in many cases, the problems, the math becomes intractable. It can't be solved. In other situations, the structure might be statically indeterminate, which causes Newton's second law to fall flat. The other thing to mention is right here at the top, and that would be Fermat's principle. Fermat's principle, which is also known as the principle of least time, states that the path taken by a ray of light in traveling from point A to point B is that path that minimizes the time taken in getting from point A to point B. It turns out that Hamilton was really inspired by Fermat's principle, which dealt with optics, and he believed a similar approach could be used to cast various classical mechanics problems as minimization problems. So the interesting thing about Hamilton's principle is Hamilton came up with the principle largely in response to optics, Fermat's principle, and how to explain it. But it turns out it has applications to a whole wide range of fields, including quantum mechanics. It's extensively used in quantum mechanics, which was only discovered about 80 odd years after Hamilton's principle came out. And this was advanced by scientists of the likes of Niels Bohr and his colleagues. So Hamilton's approach, which arose in 1835, was his unification of the language of optics and mechanics. But it had a usefulness far beyond its origin. And Hamiltonian is now most familiar as the operator in quantum mechanics. A quick word of mention, we see this word classical mechanics being bandied around a lot. Are we all comfortable with what is meant by classical mechanics? So to be clear, classical mechanics means non-relativistic mechanics. It means you're dealing with objects or masses that aren't really, really, really massive, and you're dealing with speeds that aren't approaching the speed of light. In addition, you're dealing with masses that aren't very, very, very small, like subatomic size. So that's what's meant by classical mechanics. Okay, so without further ado, let's get started with deriving Hamilton's principle. And I want to mention that the method that we're going to use here is almost identical to that which we use to derive the principle of minimum potential energy. So I would suggest you watch that video before watching this. Some of this I might have gone through in more detail in that video than I will in this video, because I will assume you've had an exposure to it already. Also assumes that you've had a prerequisite class in elasticity or solid mechanics, 
and in which case you would recognize this equation, sigma ij comma j plus fi equals rho du squared dt. This is really just Newton's second law derived on a material basis. It also assumes that you've had some exposure to this idea of index notation, and it's beyond the scope of this video to dig into that, but if any of you out there are really lost on this, and it probably be some of you, try to find a video on it, and if you can't find a suitable one, let me know and perhaps I'll create one. But again, it does assume that you know some of this. If you don't, if you haven't had exposure to this, then you're just going to have to take my word with regard to some of what I'm saying. So in the case of the principle of minimum potential energy, this term here was equal to zero because we were looking at a case of static equilibrium. In this case, when deriving Hamilton's principle, we're looking at a body which is in general in motion. This added force comes about as a result of d'Alembert's principle. Additionally, I present the equation Ti equals sigma ijnj. This is known as the Cauchy formula, and it's a method for converting stresses in a material to forces on the surface of the material. I'm not going to say more than that about this here. I did expand a little bit in the video on principle of minimum potential energy, so I'd refer you to that. Let's put this in here, Cauchy's formula, and give it some numbers, one and number two. Now, in deriving the principle of minimum potential energy, we began with the principle of virtual work. And as in that case, we got to assume some sort of a displacement field U, only this time U is now a function of both position and time, since it's a dynamic problem. And I remind you that this displacement field is subjected to some sort of a virtual displacement, and that virtual displacement is restricted such that the variation on the displacement is zero at each of the boundary conditions. Previously, the boundary conditions were at x1 and x2. However, in this case, the boundary conditions will be at t1 and t2, and I'll explain a little bit more about that later. So similarly to what we've seen in previous videos, this is subject to the variation at x and time 1 is equal to 0, and the variation at boundary condition time 2 is also equal to 0. So let's write that in. The variation of u at time 1 and the variation of u at time 2 are both 0. That will be number three. And then the virtual external work, as we've seen before, del W sub E, can be written as it's the sum of the work from two contributions. The one is from the surface tractions, and the other one is the body forces. So the first two is integrate over the surface of the body, the surface tractions times the virtual displacement. This is a virtual work term, force times displacement, ds, since we're integrating over a surface plus the integral over the volume of the work done by the body forces. The body forces are F sub I times the virtual displacement, del U, dV. This is number four. Now, if we pay attention for a second to the first term, the term I've written in blue, we can simplify that somewhat. So the surface integral of Ti del Ui dS is equal to the integral over the surface, and now we can substitute Cauchy's formula in here, sigma ij nj times del u i ds, and that is equal to, we can apply Gauss's theorem here, which tells us that we can convert a surface integral into a volume integral by taking some vector times n, and then just taking the gradient of that vector. So, volume integral, and what we've multiplied by n is sigma ij del u i, so we need to take the derivative of this, and again, in index notation, it's just comma j dv. Okay, so just before turning the page, all I've done here is I'm trying to simplify this term in blue. And what I've been able to do is using the Cauchy formula, write it in this form. And then using Gauss's divergence theorem, I can convert it from a surface integral into a volume integral. Where instead of multiplying by n, I can now take the gradient. And in index notation, this is how you show it. And again, don't worry too much if this index notation is foreign to you. Just consider the overall result that I'm presenting, and in future videos, I don't think you'll see very much, if any, of it. So just bear with me for now, and then let's take our results forward. Okay, so let me complete the rest of this on the following page. I'm just going to start off by copying this over. So the integral over the volume of sigma ij del ui comma j dv can be expanded as the integral over the volume of and then using the product rule is sigma ij comma j times del ui plus the derivative of del ui. So sigma ij del ui comma j dv. 
let's give this a number, number 5, and then substituting number 5 into number 4. So I remind you that this is number 4. We're substituting the simplification of this term in here. So substituting equation 5 into 4, we can rewrite the external virtual work as the integral over the volume of, and then I'm going to group these two terms, the sigma ij comma j from here, and the fi from here, both of them multiplied del ui, plus this term over here, sigma ij del ui comma j dv. Now this part here, which I've grouped, is simply what I presented at the beginning as f equals ma on a material level. So sigma ij comma j plus fi is equal to rho d squared u dt squared, or we can write that as rho u double dot. And again, this is from D'Alembert's principle or from Newton's second law. So making the substitution, this is equal to the integral over the volume of rho ui double dot del ui plus sigma ij, and then del ui comma j is just the strain. That's del epsilon ij. So plus sigma ij del epsilon ij dv. Now I remind you how we treated this part in the video of the principle of minimum potential energy. And we came up with a potential function u sub zero or u naught, such that sigma ij is equal to the derivative of u naught with respect to epsilon ij. So partial u naught, partial epsilon ij is equal to sigma ij. And we call u naught or u zero, I'm sorry, I use naught and zero interchangeably. We call u naught the strain energy density. So by making that substitution, the external virtual work is equal to the integral over the volume of rho ui double dot del ui dv plus del u, the variation of the strain energy. And I showed in that previous video the, the principle of minimum potential energy step by step how we got there. If any of this is confusing to any of you, I would refer you to that video. So I'm going to skim through it here. But fundamentally, this is equal to the variation of the strain energy density. And by integrating it over the volume, I get the variation of the strain energy. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to integrate both sides of these equations from T1 to T2. And what I get is the integral from T1 to T2 of del W E. And I'm going to bring that to the other side. So del W sub E minus del U dt. And that's equal to, again, the integral from T1 to T2 of everything in blue. The integral over the volume of rho ui double dot del ui dv times dt. Let's give these some numbers, 6, 7, and 8. In the case of the principle of minimum potential energy, we found that this was equal to zero because the body was in equilibrium. Now, because the body is moving, instead of this equal to zero, it's equal to rho u double dot, which is the inertial load. In, in fact, it's the inertial load per unit volume. So as a result, when we work our way through the math and down the page, what we end up with is in equation eight, the right-hand side, instead of it being equal to zero, as we saw for the static case, now it's equal to some sort of an MA type term. And, and we're gonna treat this on the next page. So turning the page, I'm just going to copy equation 8 over. And now we're going to use integration by parts again in order to transfer one of these dots to the del u. And the reason for that will become clear in a second. This gives you another opportunity to brush up on your integration by parts. And by the way, while I mentioned you're not going to see very much more, if any, index notation in future videos, you're going to see a lot of integration by parts. So start brushing up on it if you need to and start getting comfortable with it. I guarantee you I will do enough examples of it that even if you've never seen it before, you're going to be able to do it like a champ, beginning right here with your next opportunity. So what I want to do if I integrate this by parts, and the idea is I want to transfer this derivative to the del u, is first of all, I remove one of the dots and I write the boundary term. So it's the integral over the volume of rho ui dot, just one dot now, times this, del ui, dv from t1 to t2. And I remind you that this term is zero at both t1 and t2. This was an assumption we made on the first page, that part of having a kinematically admissible displacement field 
requires us to set the variation to zero at both of the boundaries. In previous videos, we've integrated between the limits of x1 and x2. However, in this video, we're integrating from t1 to t2, but mathematically it's identical. The variation of the displacement field at t1 and the variation of the displacement field at t2 must be zero since the displacement is prescribed. Okay, so this term cancels out and I end up with minus integral from t1 to t2, integral over the volume, rho ui dot, del ui dot. I've now transferred the derivative to the del ui dv dt. And that is equal to, just cancelling out the first term and leaving the second, minus the integral from t1 to t2, and then this is going to take a little while to wrap your mind around, but I've said this is the expanded form of the variation of this. Okay, I don't want to confuse you, and I want to spend a little bit of time here to make sure we're quite clear of it. But this is equal to one-half rho u squared, and if I took the variation of that, I would end up with rho u, del u, which is this. Okay, so if nothing else convinces you, just actually do the reverse operation to see that what I've done, I've just reversed the variation, and then what I've done is use the commutative property of the del operator to take it outside of the integral. So take time to just consider what I've done there, and if you have any questions, ask me. But this can be rewritten as minus the integral from t1 to t2 of, and then this integral here is just the kinetic energy. This is the kinetic energy per unit volume, and I'm integrating over the volume, so this becomes the kinetic energy, which I'm going to call t. So del t is the variation of the kinetic energy. And again, if there's any confusion in getting from here to here, just go in the reverse direction and convince yourself that taking the variation of this will give you this. And I've left out a dt. So finally, and putting this all together, I can write this as the integral from t1 to t2 of del w sub e minus del u plus del t. Just brought the del t to the other side, dt, and that is equal to zero. And this, ladies and gentlemen, is Hamilton's principle. We'll number that number nine, and let me just write here Hamilton's principle. So let's write this in a little more of a compact form. I'm going to copy equation nine over. And now I can rewrite this as the integral from t1 to t2 of the variation of t minus u minus v dt, and that's equal to zero, where I've made the substitution that v is equal to negative we. And this is following the steps I took in the principle of minimum potential energy, where we choose to write the external virtual work in terms of a potential function v, where V is just the negative of the external work, and then we can treat it as part of the system potential. And this can be rewritten as the variation from T1 to T2 of T minus pi dt, that's equal to zero. And here, similarly to what I've done before, I define pi is equal to U plus V, where pi is equal to the total potential energy of the system and is equal to the sum of the strain energy plus the potential of the external loads. Let's give these some numbers, number 10, number 11. And then finally, you ready for it? This can be rewritten as the variation from T1 to T2 of L dt is equal to zero. And all I've done is I've defined L as T minus pi. So the Lagrangian is T minus pi. It's the kinetic energy minus the potential energy of the system. I didn't come up with the Lagrangian and say the Lagrangian is something we need to minimize. What we've done is we've shown that beginning with elementary principles, which is looking at the state of stresses on the solid mechanics level, but we started on that basis and we showed through the principle of virtual work that all systems in nature that are being acted upon by a force and are moving and deforming behaves in such a way that minimizes the Lagrangian over any time interval such that its variation is zero. So this is Hamilton's principle. We'll number it number 12 and big bright red box around it. And this truly is one of the most beautiful, spectacular equations out there. It was derived as an all-encompassing equation for classical mechanics, incorporating what Hamilton knew about optics. 
it turns out to be so profound in terms of the way nature chooses to behave by minimizing certain quantities that it was found 80 years later to be applicable to quantum mechanics. And what is this quantity, the Lagrangian? T minus pi. This is not T plus pi. It's not the total energy of the system that we're minimizing. In the case of the principle of minimum potential energy, there was no T term. And what we did is we showed that any system in static equilibrium existed in a state that minimized its potential energy. One might think that for the dynamic case, we would add the kinetic energy to that and try to minimize the energy, but this is not the case. The Lagrangian is actually kinetic minus potential energy. And in many cases, it's known as action. The definition of Lagrangian, the, the kinetic minus the potential energy of the system, is known as the action of the system. I didn't like this terminology at first, but it's starting to grow on me. So Hamilton's principle is often referred to as the principle of least action, because according to Hamilton's principle, the action L is an extrema between times T1 and T2. So this simple, single, compact equation incorporates everything you have ever learned or ever will learn about classical mechanics. Newton's second law, Lagrange's equations, Equations of motion, these can all be derived from it. Even the boundary conditions will be determined from this equation, and I'll show this in other videos. This equation applies to optics, it applies to classical mechanics, to electromagnetism, and to quantum mechanics. It truly describes the nature of everything around us, all in this one simple, easy-to-remember equation. And that's all I want to present to you in this video, but before we go, I just want to whip through this again really quickly and summarize what we've seen to make sure you get the flow of it. We started off with fundamentally Newton's law on a solid mechanics basis, and also Cauchy's formula. We came up with a definition of the virtual external work, where we did a force times displacement for both the body forces and the surface forces. Body forces were integrated over the volume, and the surface forces obviously over the surface. In order to convert these surface forces into volume forces, we did the following treatment with it, where we used Cauchy's formula to convert this to stresses, and then we used the Gauss divergence theorem to get it into the form of a volume integral. We were then able to simplify it a little bit further and plug it back into the original equation, and we ended up with this expression for the virtual work. By making the substitution from before, we recognized that this first term is just rho u double dot, we showed that we could write the second term in terms of the strain energy. By rewriting the equation, we came up with this form of the equation where the external work minus the strain energy was equal to an integral that we later determined was the kinetic energy. We wrote that as the kinetic energy. We brought everything to the same side, made the right-hand side equal to zero, and we called this Hamilton's principle. We then simplified it a little bit where we made some substitutions to get it from this form here into a much more simple form of the variation from T1 to T2 of LDT is equal to zero. That's all I want to say about this video. I hope you found something interesting in it. I can certainly assure you it's incredibly useful. Please would you go and smash those like buttons to help me out. If you have any questions or comments for me or feel like you didn't get any value for money out of this, I'd love to hear from you in the comment section below. If you'd like to be notified of any future video releases, please hit the subscribe buttons and click the bells. Finally, I remind you that the notes to this lecture are available for download. A link to download them appears in the description below. Thanks for watching and keep studying.